great to see a bunch of friendly faces in the audience. So quick show of hands, because tonight we are talking about connecting DevRel and product. How many of you are dev evangelists, dev advocates in the room? OK, and how many of you are product people? OK, out of the ones who consider yourself DevRel, how many of you would call yourself dev advocates? Hands up. OK, how many would call yourself dev evangelists? OK, that's going to be relevant in a second, I promise. So hey, everybody, I'm Bear. Um, I'm currently the DevRel lead over at Twitter, primarily for our mobile platform, Fabric. Before that, I worked at Facebook for a couple of years doing DevRel there as well, also on Facebook's SDK and on Parse, the mobile backend as a service. And before that, I was at a company called Strobe that made developer tools um, for releasing hybrid apps to native mobile stores. So I've worked at companies of all different sizes, from tiny startups of 15 people to larger companies in the tens of thousands. And so what I want to talk to you guys about tonight is not just methods that work for companies of a particular size. It's about trends that I've seen throughout my career, working with developers on open source projects, on products that are closed source, and on tooling for developers. There are a couple of patterns and ways that I've found to work with product teams that have been the most effective that we want to talk about tonight. So before we get started, I asked you the question of those of you who are doing DevRel, how many of you would call yourself dev evangelists versus dev advocates? And Phil Legater, who is an awesome DevRel guy in general, wrote up this meter that you can use to check whether the activities that you're doing qualify as dev advocacy versus dev evangelism. And so in the advocacy camp, some of the things that we account include writing blog posts, um, doing developer education with documentation, capturing feedback, running alpha and beta programs, um, and interacting with product quite a bit. So I filled this out for Twitter's program, and we, we hit squarely on the advocacy mark. And so that is a really important part of our everyday job over at Twitter and in many places where you consider what you're doing inbound advocacy rather than outbound evangelism. It's less about teaching people about your product and, and convincing them to use it, though that is a part of it. A lot of it is about translating feedback back to the product team in an effective way. So uh, James Ward, who's a dev evangelist, I think he calls himself, even though he is, does a lot of advocacy too, over at Salesforce, talked about some of the seven deadly sins of dev evangelism. It's an awesome talk. It's a quick one too. And the second one, or the third one, that he brings up is about being a bridge to nowhere. So you get a ton of feedback coming in at you every single day when you're a dev evangelist. And if you're not synthesizing it and making sure you deliver it to a product team, you're committing this, this terrible act, which is that you're failing your customers in getting any of their feedback translated into actual product work. So we don't want to be a bridge to nowhere. We want to make sure that everything we're doing, talking to customers, actually ends up having a bearing on the work we do with our product. So why is this hard? Uh, hands up if you know a product person who has this as their motto, or if you are a product person and you have this as your motto. More people know some people who think like this. And it's not totally wrong. This is Henry Ford's famous quote. If I had asked people what they wanted, they would have said faster horses. And there is something to that. If you only listen reactively to what the market wants, it's hard to predict and put yourself in a good position with your product for five years down the line. You have to be forward thinking, you have to be innovating, but it is so important to bring your customers with you along the way. Another challenge when you're working with a product team is that people might not quite understand what you do. Um, when you think about when you're at your most visible as a dev evangelist, it's when you're on stage. It's when you're talking to people and you're talking the talk, you've got this razzle-dazzle performance, and that's sometimes where people's knowledge of what you do ends. They think of you as the person who gets up on stage. And it's easy to forget in that case that you're also an engineer and you know what you're talking about when it comes to integration challenges, when it comes to the architecture of your customers' apps and their workflows. So it's really important to do some internal advocacy for yourself about what you're able to do and what you can do so that people understand that when you bring feedback to them, you've really done a lot to already research customer questions and filter things out for your product team. So how do we do this in a way that keeps relationships strong with product teams and also serves our customers in the best way possible? Well, the first thing that's important is to communicate with your product team consistently. And consistently is not the same as constantly. You might have it on a semi-regular cadence or a daily, daily cadence. It's going to depend on your team size. But what you want to do is be reliable. You want them to know that when customers come to you with feedback, it's getting back to them when it matters. So the first thing to do is find channels that work. And this is one of the things that varies most by company size. It 
might be that the preferred means of talking to your engineering team when you've got a customer bug or any sort of feedback is to just chat it to them. That's something that worked even for the Crashlytics team until very recently. It was three or four years of runway on this working totally fine until we hit a sudden amount of scale that made it really hard to process that volume of feedback in chat. It was getting too noisy. But it is something that totally works. So we iterate on this process constantly. We meet with a product team and we say, all right, what is working for you? What isn't working for you? Do you want a task tracker? Does that feel like too much weight right now? Or has we, have we gotten to the point where you want it that way? Would you prefer an email? What's going to create the best signal to noise ratio for you when you're taking all of this in? And so this is something that's going to evolve over time. Some people have pretty intricate workflows that end up in tickets in a system that the product team can ingest. Sometimes that's a public portal. Sometimes it's something that only you as an internal team member can fill in. But the point is you want to be in constant communication with your product teams to find out what that is. One thing that I found personally really effective is making sure that there's somebody from DevRel in each of the product standups that are happening every single week. So that way, we can understand what's launching that week, what the key concerns are for the product team, and where their heads are when it comes to their roadmap. And for the most part, we're silent observers here. We don't need to weigh in on the product team's decisions. We just want to be informed so that later, if we have any sort of feedback from customers, we can bring it up to them. And it's easy and lightweight in a stand-up as opposed to having an email process, a chat process. But the point is, you should be working on this, and it's going to take a few iterations. Another thing to pay attention to is that when you do talk to the product teams, bring them good news just as often as you bring them bad news. If you are always the bearer of bugs, people will learn to fear your presence and la 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 la, don't want to hear it, don't want to talk to you about this, you're only putting more work on me and telling me that my stuff's broken. So it's really important to bring them back the customer love that you get and anything that you hear about things that have delighted people. As the face of your company, you tend to get all of the feedback, and some of that is taking a lot of heat for your product, and some of that is getting disproportionate amounts of love for how much people really enjoy it. So make sure you funnel that in just as often as you share the bad stuff. And the next thing is that you shouldn't be the only filter for customer feedback. It is so important to get your product teams and your engineering teams out and about with you. So that might look like if you're sponsoring a booth as part of your dev evangelism program, you should be bringing engineers and product people into the booth with you so they can have those conversations themselves. You bring a certain perspective as a dev evangelist or a dev advocate to those conversations, and they're gonna bring a different perspective. They're gonna hone in on different pieces of customer feedback, different technical challenges that they're having that you might not have, and that's totally okay. It's just important to realize your own bias in the filtering process. So if you can't get them out and about to conferences, it's great to bring them into you. You might want to host a meetup at your, at your office, or maybe something more like an integration lab. That's like a usability study come event where you bring people in, give them pizza, help them work on a product, and you all sit down together and bug bash or figure out what's working and what isn't. All of this is super important to do so that you are not the only touch point for dev evangelism. So that's broadly communicating consistently. The next thing that's really important is to be a smart filter and funnel. There is going to be a lot of feedback that you get that simply isn't relevant to your product team or that comes out of left field or that you've heard a million times before and have already considered it a won't fix. And at the same time, there's going to be a lot of stuff that's high priority for you to funnel. So how can you do this right? First thing to know is that you should always dig deeper on customer requests. You're going to have people coming to you and saying, I need Feature X. Great. Why do you need Feature X? And you might find out in the conversation that the answer is, I need feature X so I can accomplish Y. So in one of the cases, we've heard from a bunch of customers on the product I work on, which is a mobile crash reporter, that people really want an API upload endpoint for when crashes happen on their device that we uh, didn't capture for one reason or another. Maybe they weren't um, connected to the, they were connected to a debugger. Getting in the technical weeds here, but there are reasons that we wouldn't capture the report and they want to upload it. But that's not actually how the product works. And so I know that you can't just open up a RESTful endpoint and have people send predefined operating system crash events. We have to use our SDK that has a custom stack on Winder and blah, 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 blah. There's all this knowledge that's in my head that I can work with them to get deeper on their request. So I said to them, okay, why do you want this endpoint? And they say, well, I've collected a bunch of these in testing, and so I want that endpoint so I can upload everything into your tool and I treat it as my task tracker. 
So when you get to that, I want X because of Y, you bring that to the product team and they can make the decision on what X should be given that your customers want to solve for Y. And that's the role of the product manager. They're trying to think about what your customer's pain points are and what you can build to solve that. So even though your customer might ask for X, as long as you understand what the net outcome is, that they want to be able to use this as a task tracker, you can bring that feedback to the product team and then give them the leeway to do what they do best, which is figure out how to address the needs of the most customers at the same time. So resist the urge to take customer feedback at face value. Engaging in a conversation and getting more context on request always, always pays dividends. The next thing is to give good bug. As dev evangelists and advocates, you probably get a lot of bug reports from users that are pretty vague. They say something like, I saw a crash, and then the person paraphrases the stack trace. And you're like, no, I can't, I can't take a paraphrased stack trace. You have to copy paste the whole thing. Give me as much context as you can. And in the same way, sometimes because we handle such a volume of requests, we can forget that we need to give just as much context as we expect from customers when we pass bugs on to the product team. So talk with your product team, talk about what they expect from you, what minimum repro steps you should have taken when you're talking about customer requests and, and set expectations across the board with how anyone will react if you just kind of ping a message into chat like, hey, are we having ops issues? <laughs> Maybe, what's going on? Tell us a little bit more. So just keep that in mind that you are as much a consumer of the product that needs to give a good bug report as your end customers. And the last thing in this, in this particular section is to keep perspective on urgency. Uh, it's really tempting to forget when you're in a customer-facing role, that people who are working on future features are also working for customers. So when you have a bug report and you have things that people need fixed now, you have urgency from your customers saying, we need this thing, we're gonna drop the product if we don't have this thing, or we're totally blocked because your product is so borked right now, you forget that the trade-off for the product team is that they're still serving customers. It's just a different set of customers from the ones who are talking to you. So when you think about the urgency for, for one individual customer, you have to think about it in the context of your broader business. It's urgent for your customer. Is it urgent for your business? That should feel intuitively bad. And if that made you cringe right now, that's a good sign. Because anything that's urgent for your customers should be urgent for you and urgent for your business. But what you want to do is have that dialogue with your product team to find out which customer's urgency do we have the bandwidth to serve right now and what can we do for the customers who we can't serve right this minute? That's a big one. And it's hard to navigate. It's not easy. And one of the things that you'll have to do as somebody in DevRel is toe that line between keeping people happy, bought in, and served, and making sure that your product team is working on the right things. The last piece here is to close the loop. And this is both with your internal teams and with your end customers. So the first thing is to actually translate your feedback into tasks and do it collaboratively. So it's really tempting when you've been at a conference for three days straight. You just want to like write one massive email with feedback, just <laughs> one three-page thing, and call it done. You send it in, and you're like, do with this what you will. I'm out. And that's something you want to avoid, right? Because you're not necessarily sure what's going to happen with that long feedback email until you actually see it translated into tasks. And I'm not saying that you should sit here and like look over your product manager's shoulder and be like, is that done yet? But when you bring more context and you actually have a conversation with the product team, you have the chance to make sure that your tasks actually make it into their to-do list. And that's something that they should have the primary say in. Of course, it's their to-do list. But if you take the time to actually break things down and figure out they asked, asked for X because they want to do Y, and what do we turn that into when it comes to day-to-day -day work, this becomes much, much effect, more effective. Another thing that's important is to be transparent with customers about the status of a feature that's coming down the line. Obviously, Mozilla is able to be a gold standard because they're an open source company and their entire roadmap is totally open to people. And their feature requests and their bug trackers, all of it is wide, wide open. And there are reasons that your product team may or may not want to do that. It may feel risky if there's something that you know that you explicitly don't want to build, but it's a top customer request. It's kind of awkward to have it lingering there for weeks, months, even years, and have it visibly go unaddressed. That said, when people come to you and ask for things that you know you're not going to build, you don't need to lie to them and say, oh yeah, totally, we'll, we'll definitely get right on that. 
it's fine to have the conversation where you say, thank you so much for this feedback. I really appreciate your extra context if you engaged in dialogue with them more. And what we can do is we can notify you if we work on this in the future. And I, when I do that, I'm usually pretty clear that we're not necessarily doing it in the short or medium term. I don't want people coming back to me in a week and being like, is it out yet? Did you release it? And sometimes we do get there. Sometimes we do get to surprise people like one hour and it's released and they're like, oh my God, mind blown. And that's a great feeling. Um, but the side benefit of this, when you say to people, we might work on this in the future, can I keep you notified, is that you build up a beta list. You can immediately have a ready to go list of when you do tackle some of these features, customers to reach out to who are gonna give you beta feedback and your, your best advocates who are gonna be excited about the new feature when you launch it. So it's a great thing to do and it's really handy to have that customer list ready whenever you're, you're going to be releasing something. The last piece there is to show internal teams the impact too. So every week on the Fabric team, we have a kickoff where we have one slide that's full of customer feedback from the past week. It might be tweets, it might be excerpts from emails, and we like to focus on things that have launched that week. So if we got any customer feedback about a new dashboard design or a new feature related to email, we show it in that, in that kickoff slide so that everyone on the team can understand the broader impact of what they've done. And it's super helpful. It keeps the team excited about keeping in contact with customers and also helps show the impact of what they've done. And it's super, super powerful for keeping people connected to customers. So summing it all together, there are a few things that you can do, and this is true for companies of any size, even though your methodology might change a little bit company to company. The first is to communicate consistently. That means making sure that you're bringing good news and bad news. It means that you're working hard to get the, the team out with you to events and have live customer touch points. And it also means that you're filtering and funneling correctly. You want to make sure that you're giving the product team the best information that you can from everything you're seeing, but also blocking out anything that you know that they've already heard or can't work on for one reason or another. And then the last piece, always have to close the loop. Make sure that customers understand just as well as your product teams what's going on and what's going to be worked on in the future. So I'm happy to take questions or get more specific about how any of this works at a teeny tiny company versus a larger one. Um, opening up for questions. Thanks. That sounds really sad to me. If you've got a team of people building something for a group of people that they're literally or figuratively looking down on. Um, and I think that the only way you can really solve that is by bringing in customers and making sure people have touch points there. So if you don't personally have the leverage with your team to be trusted as the voice of the customer, get some real customers in and get customers in from companies that they respect. Or if they don't respect the company, know that they need the company, <laughs> like one of your bigger customers, people who they know they can't afford to lose. And that hopefully should help bring it home to them who they're building for and why it's important to address their needs now. One of the things that's tough about developer tools sometimes is that we think of ourselves as the primary audience because we are developers, so obviously we know what we want. But it's easy to forget after you've been building dev tools for a long time what standard workflows are at other companies or what the real pain points are for people who are on other types of teams. So keeping those customer touch points is paramount. Yeah, at, at smaller companies, the trite phrase is that you wear a lot of hats. And in those cases, I often find that product marketing and dev advocacy do work super closely together, sometimes are the same people, if not the same department. And when you're working at a developer product company, that makes perfect sense, right? You want somebody who's developer literate to be writing your documentation, writing your marketing copy, explaining what your product does, and finding out who your target segment is. And so the way that that plays out is that you get feedback not just for the product team, but also for yourself. So when you're writing any sort of copy and making sure it resonates, or if you're trying to do segmentation and audience analysis and understand who you're trying to reach, you are your own customer in addition to providing information to the product team. So that's, that's been my experience. Was there? That's a good question. I don't know that there was a skew one way or another. We were just working so many hours that it was like, well, during the day, obviously you're doing the marketing stuff, and then at night you've got all the events, and on weekends you've got the events. So 
it wasn't it wasn't really a trade off. It was why not both <laughs> startups. So realistically, at larger companies in particular, you do have a certain tier of partner who are strategic for other reasons besides money, and they are the ones who you want to pay extra attention to serving their needs. And if there's anything that is relevant to keeping the deal going, you have to pay attention to that. When it comes to other customers, what we try to do is put our put our product hat on and think like a PM. If you're getting a request from a customer maybe about supporting a new platform, what's the total addressable market that you get if you if you do that? If you solve a bug for this one customer, is it an edge case or is it touching a lot of people? Um, and so we keep track of the number of people who have asked us for a particular feature. And we also try and keep perspective on whether something is mission critical for those customers or whether it's a nice to have. And so priority doesn't just come out of who the customer is, but also if they represent a persona or a type that has a particular need from the product that is shared by a lot of people. So triaging is labor intensive, but it's part of the role. So we think about maintaining feature request trackers, and we also do try and get a sense of how big is this person's company? Are we seeing a trend between this request coming in from junior developers versus senior developers, large company, mid-size, small company, and, and give more context to the product team that way. We try and avoid necessarily making a value judgment on what's more important to tackle, but the more context we can give, we can, we can let others make that value judgment and build it into the roadmap. Yeah, those are the ones that are super tough. Um, whenever you're dealing with anyone who's trolling with you, trolling you or has a complaint, it's always so much harder if they're right and you know it. And so in those cases, it becomes really important to be maintaining that list of customers who have said something and also doing that next level of digging deeper because if this is the 32nd person who has come and told you that I need to have custom filters for my analytics, blah. Okay, why? Tell me more, tell me more about your business. And I found that people respond better to giving the broader scope of a person's problem than being prescriptive about a solution. Because at the end of the day, the product manager's job is to decide on the solution. So if you just give them all the context they could possibly need and say, here's a solution over here, you can, you can lead them to water. And if, if that still doesn't work, always the voice of the customer will be more powerful than yours. So if you can bring someone in who, who carries any kind of clout or who you know the product manager respects or doesn't want to, doesn't want to lose there, it really helps. Yeah. Thanks. And just a, a quick note in closing, I don't want anyone to walk away from this talk thinking that product and DevRel are in any way opposed or at odds with one another. We are partners, and this is just about how we can make partnership more effective. I um, have been lucky enough that it hasn't been like, I run into a lot of PMs who are like, no, I will never listen to what you say. It's more about us not being a bridge to nowhere and dropping things on the floor and making sure our feedback is effective. So hopefully, that's been a takeaway as well tonight. Thank you.